Thank you for joining our community circle. My name is Sarah Sigerlin, Head of Community Programs at Crystal Bridges. And uh, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. If you'd like to take advantage of our live captioning, we are providing this through the CC icon on your bar. Please note that we are recording this session for educational purposes. So to provide a little context about uh, our community circle and to welcome you all, the purpose of the community circle is to spark more discussion about current events impacting our community. For some time, Crystal Bridges and the Momentary have been reflecting on the importance of culture and conversations and critical thinking. In 2020, we made a commitment to becoming an anti-racist institution. And part of that commitment is calling out white supremacy when we see it, using the museum as a toolbox to discuss difficult subjects, coming together as a community and creating lasting change. We want to provide a space for civil discourse, offer historical perspectives, lift up marginalized voices and carry forth the work of promoting equality. As part of that effort, our team came together to create In Real Time, a new series of live virtual programs formed in response to current events affecting our community. The goal of this series is to provide the public with knowledge and understanding around history in our current moment and to connect participants with community leaders who are in this circle tonight artists and experts about select topics in real time. For our in real time series in the month of February, we are focusing on how we have been impacted by the Capitol Hill insurrection, both locally and nationally. Programming includes tonight's community circle. An open mic will be held on Sunday, February 28th. This will be virtual, so you can join that called Pass the Mic for Justice in collaboration with Stacy Harper's Poetic Justice Group and Mighty by Design Studio. Education resources that you can find online. And also this past formal panel discussion, which was held on February 1st, on the history of democracy, racism, and ideology, which was in collaboration with Dr. Karee Banton and the University of Arkansas Department of African and African American Studies. I would like to take a moment and recognize many colleagues and partners who have helped make this series possible. I'd like to acknowledge our public programs and community program staff, Maura Anderson, Emily Rodriguez, Gabby Trevino, Marissa Reyes and the entire team who work click quickly to respond. I'd also like to give a special thank you to our community collaborators at large across NWA, the NAACP Northwest Arkansas chapter, also our devoted museum members and patrons who cont continue to support all of our programs. In tonight's community circle, we'll discuss how the Capitol Hill insurrection has impacted us locally and why education matters in empowering, informing, and preventing dangerous ideologies in Northwest Arkansas. So for tonight's circle, we have our circle leaders here. We have Diana Dominguez. You can wave your hand. She is a multicultural liaison at the Fayetteville Public Library. Thank you, Diana, for being here. We also have Dr. Kobe Davis, who is the president He's waving his hand there. He's, he's the president of the NAACP chapter in Northwest Arkansas and also the principal at Archer Learning Center High School in Springdale. And also joining the community circle is Zora J. Murph. He is a, he's waving right there. Thank you, Zora. He is an artist and also a professor at the University of Arkansas School of the Arts. And then our facilitator this evening is Anthony D. Nicola. Hi, Anthony. He is uh, the inclusion liaison for U of A's Chancellor's Office on Diversity Inclusion Matters. 
And I'm thrilled that Anthony has helped shape the program and the questions tonight. So I'm going to now toss to Anthony, who will kickstart this program. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Sarah. And, and really, thank you so much to, to all of you for being a part of this, this conversation. As, as Sarah pointed out, <clears throat> the, the Crystal Bridges and the Momentary, like many institutions across Northwest Arkansas, across this country and across the globe, um, have really taken both the intersection of, of the global pandemic of COVID-19 and the pandemic of racial inequality to take a moment to understand that it's not enough to simply not be racist. We have to take that extra step and to, to grapple with what does it mean to be anti-racist? Um, tonight, we're not going to, to be going far into defining those terms. I, I know that we all can, can go to the the library or to um, a, a local bookshop, hopefully a black owned bookshop and, and find some incredible resources um, as well as uh, online sources on what does it mean to be anti-racist, but we're doing some of that work tonight by tackling these hard conversations and activating not only within ourselves, but within our community, um, what we have access to be able to do in our everyday lives, in our community and in our inner circles. Um, in order to sort of uh, create some some agreements and some norms for this conversation. Um, I have four um, that I ask that we uh, take on for this conversation tonight. The first one is that I ask that we listen to learn and not respond. Um, both those of us who are part of um, uh, sort of the asked folk to, to be in this circle and those of you who, who came by choice, um, there'll be plenty of time for us to, to have deep conversation. I ask that you really, when you are listening, do that actively, really take that moment to take in what you're hearing and then for form uh, some ideas on maybe a response or jot down some notes. Um, the second one is take space and make space, especially those who um, have had these conversations before. I say that you make space for folks who have not engaged in these sorts of conversation before. Uh, welcome them into this space. For those uh, who are new to these conversations, this is a great place to perhaps ask some questions. Know that you're not gonna get them all answered tonight, but this is a great way to, to get your mind thinking about what do I need to know to be an active member of social change in my community. Um, also, this is a, a, an ask for those from dominant identified spaces to also make space for, for those from, from more traditionally marginalized communities to have some space to, to express themselves here as well. Um, number three is what is said here stays here. What is learned here leaves here. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, these are very vulnerable conversations. Uh, and we ask that if you learn a lesson, oh, honey, I ask that you take that into your personal life and just spread that uh, as far and wide as you can. Um, but in terms of, of keeping the, the anonymity of, of those stories, let's, let's make sure that we do that. Um, we are finally, this is number four, we're all seeking communities of respect, belonging, and mutual development. We all deserve respect. We all deserve to, to not just be included, but to have a sense of belonging. I always like to use this term belonging because you all know what that feels like to be included. Think of all those email chains and, and, and text groups that you are on in which people are talking and you're like, ain't nobody listening to, I don't want to go to Chick-fil-A. Why is everybody making plans to go to Chick-fil-A? That sense of belonging is that you have room to express yourself and that room to be heard as well. And then that leads to the, the last one, that, that sense of mutual development. That we all move forward when the, the best of us and those of us who, who are the best but maybe are, are not being seen are able to develop um, in, in harmony with one another. So those are my agreements. I ask that if you can, uh, let's test out using the chat box. However you want to agree, give me a yes, give me a yas queen, give me a thumbs up emoji if you're on your phone. However you want to agree to these agreements, I just want to know that we are all uh, in this together, all right? I usually, I'm, if I'm talking to students, I always say this is high school musical. We are all in this together. All right. 
Um, but we are all adults here, even though some of you look like you are too young to be a part of these deep conversations and that's called pandering. So, all right, I got to preach. I got a bunch of yeses. I got to hear for it. Good. All right. So you should know this about me. I love to use humor to, to break down barriers between us and these conversations. Know that we can talk about serious stuff and have a good time. Surprise, surprise. Social development doesn't have to be dry, boring, and painful. Um, we are challenging hard topics. Let's give ourselves a little bit of a break. All right, so uh, we are good on these agreements. Before we start digging into some, some of these questions that I have prepared um, with, with Sarah, Zora, can you lead us through a, a, a sort of a grounding exercise, bring us all into the space together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you everybody for coming tonight and thank you, Anthony, for such a you know, sort of wonderful introduction and Sarah for you know, bringing us all together. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're just going to do um, a sort of embodiment exercise. We're going to look at um, some images and, uh, you know, use that chat function just to, to get ourselves, you know, in the, in the spirit of participating, thinking critically, um, ready to engage. So uh, let me share my screen here. Okay. so. Um, so yeah, so let's just take a moment and um, maybe try to gain a sense of what each of us are feeling uh, individually inside your body about coming into this topic tonight, um, you know, to talk about these, these critical issues. Um, and so our hope is that this exercise will help each of us understand and connect with different feelings that we hold and that we embody. And then at the end of the program, we'll do a similar exercise again to see how we're feeling as we uh, depart. Um, and so the image that you see here on the screen, uh, this, is an, this is a photograph that I made. Um, and I'd like you to sit with this image and just look at it slowly. Um, you know, whether it's the, the building, it's brick, it's windows, the fence line in the front, um, or even just the light. Um, and then I'm just gonna, um, we can just take, you know, like 15 seconds here just to, just to look and think. So this image is of the Vernon Chapel African American, or sorry, African Methodist Episcopal Church in the Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and I made this image after um, I was there on an editorial assignment, um, you know, making photographs for a magazine. Uh, and I made this image after learning that the white foundation of the building is the last surviving structure of the, of the Greenwood neighborhood. Um, before it was firebombed and destroyed uh, by a racist white mob in 1921. And so as I was making this image, I thought about our relationship to truth, specifically how can we think critically about the world to reconcile with the truth of institutionalized racism and the tragedies that result. So as you're experiencing this image, um, if you'll take a moment and just type a word or a phrase into the chat uh, that conveys how your body feels, how you feel, um, and as you are um, responding, I will um, sort of read out responses that, that I'm receiving. White, remote, ghosts, segregated, receptive, historical tension, and layered figuratively and literally, fear, and heavy, disappointed and sad. Rust, B, 
barrier. Survival. Fenced in. Okay, so let's uh, let's take some time, some more time, and, and dig a little bit deeper by considering our own lived experiences. Think about the historical significance of this site and how it connects the past to the present. Um, sorry, excuse me. How it connects past racial injustices to present racial injustices. Consider the ways that hatred and oppression are inherited and carried forward all of the big and small ways racism is perpetrated on a daily basis. Now take some more time and, and type a word or phrase into the chat and I'll, I'll read those out again as you think a little bit more deeply. Pain, tenacity, discomfort, white terror, black resilience, Phoenix, ashamed. Grind. Alone. Grit. Disruption of safe space, holy space, purge, separate, se or excuse me, separate, <clears throat> frustration, Walled off. Fight. All right, um, thank you everyone for, for participating. So um, we can kind of leave the exercise there for now and then we'll um, get into our discussion and we'll, we'll kind of repeat this at the end and, and maybe um, you know, search for some, some of those deeper insights with what we carry away from our, our conversation this evening. Thank you, Zora, and and really thank you, everyone, for for going there. You know, we talk about this this work. It is deeply personal. Um, it is deeply traumatic. It is so incredibly important. Um, and and so I thank you all for for going there on a Monday evening. Um, I, I would ask that throughout this discussion, if you need to take breaks, if you need to go get some water, if you need to pet your 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 puppy, whatever you have, uh, please do that to take care of yourself. Um, 
tonight, uh, Sarah queued up that our reflecting questions are, are really twofold. Where do we go from here? Action, where do we go? Where are we? I really like this exercise because it gives us that attempt to look inward. Where, do, where am I right now? Um, where are we collectively? And, and pointedly, where does education play a role in this? Um, and know that we're gonna talk about art because look who's hosting us uh, and look who's hosting this conversation. And art is a, is a form of education. We learn so much about ourselves. We learn so much um, by you know, holding a mirror up to nature if it were. So I wanna start this, this uh, first section of questions um, and, and just so you all know, um, I'm gonna be asking some questions and I will pose them to some specific folks and then I will open them up for, for some greater discussion. So know that everybody, everybody's perspective is invited um, and also feel free to drop some things in the chat as well. So this first question is, um, Diana, I'm gonna start by coming to you with this one. From your perspective, how have you seen our region impacted? Um, specifically by, you know, the Capitol Hill insurrection. And really out of it, what we're seeing is this rise in hate group recruitment and activity here, you know, in the country. But I've been reading reports today, we're seeing it multinationally. Yeah, that's not daunting at all to start. <laughs> I'm setting you up for know, uh, a I tough know. one. We talked about this. Um, yeah, I, I think it's important to name things for what they are. And I think it's important to talk about the insurrection being um, an act of white supremacy. Um, it was instigated by past administration um, who I believe was a white supremacist um, and perpetuated white supremacy. So I think what we saw at the insurrection was that um, I think for folks that um, aren't BIPOC, so black indigenous or people of color or pertain to a marginalized identity, it was shocking to see, um, I won't give his full name, but to see the white supremacist Richard from Gravit, Arkansas, who was only, what, 20, 30 minutes living from here up here at the insurrection um, at uh, the assistant Nancy Pelosi's office. Um, so I think it wasn't surprising to, to BIPOC communities to know that there are people among us that have those feelings. Um, I think it was maybe shocking for people to see to see that and also not wanting to own him and say, that's not us, that's someone else. And I think it's important um, that we also recognize that that's someone that came from our community. That's someone that, I don't know all of his history, um, but that's someone that lived uh, in Benton County. Um, so I think, I think um, I, that's as far as I, as, in, as I know in terms of just understanding how it's impacted the region. I think, yeah, like as I mentioned before, for BIPOC people, it wasn't something that, that was surprising whatsoever. But I think for folks outside of, that, of those communities, it was just more so shock and, and, and not wanting to, um, you know, recognize that that's someone from, from within our, our community. And to be honest with you, this conversation is a little bit hard and emotional for me because I think I'm still kind of grappling with my own kind of reflections because the day that it happened, you know, I, I was like, I can't have this, I can't have these conversations at work. I can't have, um, I'm not in spaces where I feel like we can. So thank you for this space. Thank you for the people, um, the panelists that are joining me in this space, because I think it's hard to have these conversations. And, and thank you for the folks as well that are willing to engage in these conversations that are on, on it. Thank you, Diana, for, for going there um, and out of the gate, taking on this, this momentum, momentum, momentous, huh? Uh, question and and really being able to hone it in that that may have happened over there, but over there affects all of us. And over there was led by folks from right here um, that we see this rise in this activity amongst every community. That th there are folks who are uh, who find themselves feeling a sense of, of victimhood, feeling that sense of isolation, and acting out in these ways. And uh, it, is, it is very jarring and uh, especially those from, from traditionally marginalized communities, it's not surprising to think that, um, you know, the systems that have 
been able to, to, to flourish in this country are able to create space for, for these sorts of um, acts. Um, Zora, I wanna to go to you uh, next with this, this same question. Do you have any more perspective on, on the impact yeah. in this region? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that, you know, um, like I, I've been thinking a lot about just like what has transpired, um, you know, like since uh, Donald Trump was elected into office. And I think for me, um, well, I think for like a lot of people, you know, like that this has been our reality the entire time but I feel like with his election into office, it just exacerbated or like, you know, yeah, just it, it brought forth what was already there. Um, you know, like institutionalized racism existed 2015, you know, um, but then, you know, post 2016, it was just people felt emboldened to not really care, you know, like that, that it was okay to, to just start saying things more openly. Um, and I, I think, you know, Diane, I appreciate your answer, especially, you know, how you mentioned sort of rhetoric when it comes to these moments. And, um, you know, that term, this isn't us, right? And I, I feel like that's often used as uh, sort of like a, a phrase to, um, you know, to, to differentiate ourselves from, you know, people, um, you know, who don't like carry our ideals, right? Um, and, but yeah, I mean, it's exactly right. Like this is that one of, you know, one of the people there is a person from our own community. And that, and to me, I, I feel like uh, in, these, in these discussions, it's important to maybe start to get away from that rhetoric that just becomes the blanket, you know, or, or a way of erasing the truth. Um, that, you know, this, this is us, this has always been us. This has been us since, you know, 1619. Um, you know, since we decided to, to enslave people. Um, and then that has bled forward into everything that we do. It's, it's a reality. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's what I would, how I would respond to that. Thank you, Zora. I, 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 th I that resonates with me so much, that idea of, you know, th this couldn't be me. That's, this, this is not, that is not us. Um, I, and I also want to point out, you know, we, we're talking about political figures and, and, and the rise of this sort of rhetoric. I also want to make sure that we point out that there are racists, you know, who vote on every uh, side of the aisle, that there are no states that have the, the, the corner. You know, I grew up in Massachusetts and some of the most egregious acts of, of, of uh, vile, vitriolic, uh, egregious racist racism I've ever experienced were there in Massachusetts, not, you know, and as the, you know, a bastion of, of, of liberalness. Um, that is not to say that what we have experienced and what we have seen uh, in normalized is very, is vastly different. Um, but you're absolutely right. These structures, you know, our democracy was built on, on, you know, keeping slavery going and making sure women didn't, um, have any rights uh, in this nation. So lest we, we forget um, our democracy was, you know, and, and, and the changes that we have seen are, um, are antithetical to the original structures. And so that's why we see this constant need for these sorts of conversations on structural change, societal change, um, because our society was not built on these ideas and these mandates. Um, as you pointed out, starting in 1619 and reckoning with that history and knowing all of the progress that we have gone we have we have made we have to reckon with our past as well um kobe anybody else i want to open this question up really to 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 anybody how you've seen um a, an impact otherwise kobe i have a more specific question for you if anybody else um doesn't have something to drop in i mean anybody across the across the board everybody is is part of this circle All right, Kobe, I do have a, a more specific question for you. Um, why, why does education, I think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, is, is it a why question? And I think it is. Why do you, in your opinion, do you think education matters in informing and empowering people while also at the same time preventing dangerous ideologies um, from festering here in, in Northwest Arkansas? 
Um, well, I like a quote by Nelson Mandela that says, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Um, I love that quote. It's like one of my favorites and it's part of why I am an educator. I do believe that by education, we can help people change the world. I, I kind of echo two things that have already been said. Diana mentioned this idea of not feeling safe to say how we feel. And, and Zora kind of talked a little bit about this idea that it's always been here. It's not really new. Um, we've maybe pretended and maybe been able to pretend that it wasn't here. Hopefully education is there to help people learn to think, to help people learn to discern. Um, we receive information from so many places and um, we need to learn as thinkers how to determine what is valid, what isn't valid. I mean, Diana started out right away with some ideas that one person would say is completely truth and other people would say is completely false. And it's because of where they're getting their information from and people don't know how to discern and politicians and many others, the news media, they have become masterful in manipulating people's thoughts with the words and language that they use. And we as educators are tasked with helping people be able to read into that and see there's more to those words than what's being presented to us. Um, we have to ask questions and start conversations that will get people to think. Um, I mean, access is what education can provide. And I wish I could tell you that I really believe that we're positioned currently to, um, to eliminate a lot of these ideologies. But unfortunately, education is filled with those same types of thinkers. Um, and that's very unfortunate, but it's real. And I, I have a hard time sometimes when my coworkers um, see the world so differently than I see it. And I can't understand how you chose a profession of working with people and molding minds when you see things in such a way. And so I know what education is supposed to do. I just don't know that we're always able to do it because we're flawed, because we're, we consist of people. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I wish I had great answers, but that's, that's kind of what I thought. No, Kobe, that that you, you you speak so many different universal truths. You know, everybody's head is nodding when we think of what is the role of education. You said the magic word access. Um, and to me, I define power as access to resources. And that can come in so many different forms. It's the five-year-old wanting to access the, the cookie jar. That is power. It is the 16-year-old getting the keys to the car. That is power. It is influence. And you talk about that education. And in our modern world, education is that access to work. It is access to a career, access to the levels of power that are, are, are incredibly important as an adult to be able to have. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's research out of um, Suffolk University and, and, and the University of, of Massachusetts in Boston. There's a group there that is working with youth practitioners and studying how to challenge the rise in um, uh, uh, fasc fascism, uh, male supremacy, and white supremacy. And the number one thing that they talk about in this work is being able to create a sense of community. And that, when I heard that, I went to a, a talk and I heard that it blew my mind because you, you, we all are talking about community in different ways. And I thought, you know, these, these folks probably looked for community in these groups, but what they are targeting these, these, you know, male supremacy, white supremacy, fascist mindsets, they are all over, they're on YouTube, they're all over the place, but they are looking to stoke that sense of isolation and that sense of frustration and victimhood. And they are trying, what they are really doing is, is counteracting what you're talking about. They're miseducating them and, 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 and leading them away from the access that, a, that an education, a universal strong education to be able to think critically, think analytically, to find nuance. Um, and so 
it's incumbent on all of us in all of our in our, you know, our personal lives to be looking for and creating that sense of community, especially with young folks, so that we can bring them back into the fold and bring them um, back into that sense of education that should be easier for them to access in the, you know, the, the digitally native age that so many of these young folks are are a part of. Um, but you, you, you speak so much truth, so don't deny what you are saying well, as, as, as brilliant. Anybody else? Anthony, please? I was gonna add one more thing. I yeah. had an argument with a friend of mine who is an educator as well. And mm -hmm. I would say we actually agree in almost everything. However, he sees it as his personal mission to tell kids what is right. And the argument was, well, what are we supposed to be doing as educators? And so you feel good when somebody who's saying the right thing is telling kids what's right. But unfortunately, we're also flooded with people who are not necessarily telling the right thing. A coworker today said to me that um, all opinions are not opinions. Some are fact and some are complete fantasy. And so I love that. I love that thought. I love that idea because that's true. It, it really is. I mean, we say, oh, everybody can have an opinion, but some people's opinions are just fantasy it is not <laughs> any truth whatsoever I, that is that is amazing I'd like to speak on education in terms of I think oftentimes when we talk about education we need to think about how we define education I think um Kobe I think in your in your um what you're talking about is I think what we think of more of is like traditional or institutional education or knowledge that we've gleaned because of our own access to those institutions, even though historically our communities haven't always had access to that. And even currently still, there's like so many inequities that exist for our communities when it comes to accessing education. But I think it's also important for us to recognize, and I say this because um, community work and community organizing um, and involvement is really important to me and recognizing how our own personal stories, our community stories also form that part of the education. I think a lot of the reason why there is this tension to that exists about what actually happened at, at the insurrection is because there's folks that participated in it that have this narrative, but then there's BIPOC people that were in that building. So many of them um, were actually you know, um, having to even clean up the mess that was made after their insurrection that have their own stories and histories that I think need to be recognized um, as a part of kind of making these informed decisions or educational decisions of how we interpret things. Um, I think I just wanted to, to bring in that there's thinking about education beyond um, just knowledge that we attain through through school, but thinking about you know, knowledge that's passed down. I think about my mom who, you know, didn't have access to edu higher education like me, but yet she's been able to impart on me so, so much more than I feel like I necessarily gained through like a traditional educational base. And I think about, you know, community organizers in the area that have all this, you know, knowledge that they've gleaned from the community. Um, so I, I would also like us to think about education beyond, beyond this like K through 12, but what exists within our own personal his histories, narratives, and in our communities. Thank you, Diana, for bringing that up because I was going to ask a question a little bit later, and I and we're we're there is is creating that access to education and thinking of. I mean, I think that that's a, a brilliant even. Uh, way of thinking about what does education mean? And we're talking about how do we create uh, pathways into education for all folks in our communities of all ages, of all identities? How do we bring them into this sense of education? Because we know that this is a way of dismantling racism, white supremacy, these power inequities in both our local and state level. So, so Kobe, what are your thoughts on, on challenging and, and creating access to, to all forms of education? No, I think, I think Diana's right. I mean, yes, but even if we're talking outside of institutional education, it's still about giving people access. It's still about teaching people to be critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. So we need to be creating and finding those opportunities all around us. I think many of us are involved in organizations and avenues that those are still our focus. Those are still our, our goals. And it's not a school, but it's about education. It's about teaching. It's about exposing people and giving them access. So I agree wholeheartedly that 
that it's not just a school situation, but it should still be about this idea of helping people be critical thinkers. I mean, like- I love that. I, jo joy, joy just dropped in th this idea of, of the idea of heritage. How do we bring yeah. that? How do we tap into those access points? Because how many different uh, communities uh, uh, folks from, you know, I, I think immediately I'm thinking of indigenous, I'm thinking of native uh, uh, identities that, that have such long-standing traditions of oral storytelling and being able to pass narratives and be able to pass history uh, in different ways, shapes, and forms. And it's so important that we uh, create those access pipelines from a very early age and that we continue to foster. That's my big thing is continuing to foster that sense of education beyond just high school. And, and I'm not even talking about into college. I'm talking about being adult critical thinkers. We often think at a certain age that I'm done and and learning is a gift it you know we say thank you when we get a gift and and how are we creating those opportunities in our communities Diana do you want to talk a little bit uh about your work in terms of the library and, and what are some ways in which um you are, are in the library in Fayetteville are, are creating these sorts of opportunities yeah so um, within the library, as, as Sarah had mentioned prior, my position is a multicultural community liaison. So my prime focus is, is connecting community members, primarily Spanish speaking and Marshallese, um, as well as other uh, BIPOC communities to the resources and programs that, that we have um, at the library. Um, I think it's, it's very easy to look at in certain institutions and be like, oh, you know, it's a public library, it's open and accessible to everyone, but I, you know, consistently have conversations with staff members that we, we have to dispel that myth of neutrality that exists because there's still white supremacy re reigns in all spaces. It just looks differently. Um, uh, Dr. Carol Anderson talks about white rage and how it, how it manifests dif differently across, across spaces. Sorry, my dog's barking. Um, so I think there needs to be, you know, I, I think I, I want to talk about the work, but I also want to like the work that I do, but I think it's important for me to talk about also as an institution ways that we can continue to, you know, tear down uh, these barriers, but I think dispelling that that myth of neutrality that all spaces are neutral, or that we all have access in the same way for some reason I think we think that you know our positionality we shouldn't be having conversations about our relationship like our identities and how we um, in some spaces we can enter those spaces freely and comfortably you know but in other spaces we can't like I think there needs to be more open conversations about that um, I think it's it's important definitely to um, the work that I do is also recognizing again uh, libraries aren't this great equalizer you know recognizing our positionality I think it's really important to look at community so looking at what has the history of the public library, how has it existed in the lives of BIPOC people over time? You know, um, the, the public library is, is you know, close to um, the only cemetery that allowed enslaved people to be in Fayetteville. And I think that history needs to be talked about, the proximity to that, the proximity to displacement of Black folks within the city, um, so I think bringing in that history to then understand why maybe certain communities aren't engaged currently, why maybe there hasn't been relationships created in a way that would make everyone feel welcome. Um, and this isn't to, I think the work that we do as a public library is great and we provide opportunities for, for various folks, but I, I think that there's shifts that need to happen and the ways in which we reframe our own understanding to, to coming into that. And I think libraries are a great place for that. I think hosting conversations like these, which thank you, Sarah, for letting me up being a part of this um, is great. But I think it's understanding the community, but also supporting the community. There's already great community work that's existing out there. And it's not my job to try to somehow recreate the wheel or I think it's really disrespectful and dishonorable to try to create something rather than actually support the ongoing efforts that that already exist that have uh, been created by BIPOC people. So a lot of the programming that I do is really just partnering with community organizations or folks that that can help to, um, you know, talk about their work because we have such a big, big platform. 
Thank you so much, Diana, for, for two things, for, for dropping in um, all of that information uh, and, and also modeling what it's like to talk critically about an organization that you are uh, embedded in, that you are a part of, that uh, we all work for institutions that have a lot of work to do and we can see all of the wonderful steps that they are taking, but we can also say we are not perfect and that we have a lot more work to do structurally, systemically in order for us to be achieving those, those goals. So thank you so much for that, Diana. That is important for us to all witness, to, to breathe in and to experience. Thank you for that. That's very, very brave and vulnerable work. Um, I, I, we're, we're flying through time and I wanna make sure that I'm respectful of, of our time. So I'm gonna cut some, some questions and I wanna ask, Zora, I wanna go to you and, and, and fold in this idea. You started off so beautifully with um, one of your incredible photographs and folks need to, to go to, to Zora's uh, website later and really take some time uh, later this week and really take in all of um, his incredible, incredible work. Uh, I've just been blown away going through, uh, th through your, your, your photographs and, and the critical lens with which you look. Um, talk to us a little bit, if you will, about the role that art can play in both education as we've been talking about, truth telling as we've been talking about, um, and, and really at this moment that we're living through, how does it transcend? How does it, how does it connect with us in this moment that we're living through? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, art, art does a lot of different things. And, you know, so I, I feel like, um, you know, there's, how do I, how do I say this? think that you know like as a, as an artist I'm I'm a person who I guess um, I, I love utilizing art as a form of education um, and so you know I like sort of like as a as a student um, I always like I my my pictures are very aesthetically pleasing to look at but it never ends there for me. But often when we engage with art, um, you know, typically people are, are sort of, you know, looking at it in, um, in a kind of passive way and not really like giving time and space to, to dig deeper or think more critically um, about, you know, what the artist might be saying or expressing. Um, but to me that, that connects back with the idea of accessibility because like, you know, if you have access to art, you know, if we think about visiting Crystal Bridges, um, you know, it, like the, the art is there, but then it's up to you as an individual to take the time and, and devote the energy to try to, to, to ask deeper questions. Um, and I think that, you know, trying to teach students who aspire to be artists, um, you know, uh, someone dropped the, the term discomfort in the chat earlier. And I often, I talk about discomfort a lot, um, not only because I understand, um, understand like what it means to be uncomfortable or experience discomfort, you know, on a daily basis, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, as an artist, um, you know, like embracing that you're, that you're uncomfortable sometimes, um, you know, kind of throwing yourself into the unknown, which is a, <laughs> you know, puts you in a space to, to be uncomfortable. Um, that's often where you find a lot of answers. Um, and, and so, um, I mean, to me, like that's the role that, that art sort of plays is that I'm, I think that art can be used to facilitate social interaction um, you know, and, and that it can be used as a tool for education, um, both as a maker and as a, you know, as a person looking at art. Thank you for that, Zora. Um, I used to work for a company for, for 10 years called Catharsis Productions, and that word, um, art in any shape, fashion, or, for, or form is one of the, for the, the onlooker, the, the recipient, it is um, one of the safest ways to be unsafe. 
um, because an, a piece of art, a play, a, a, a film, a, a piece of music can 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 bring those things to the surface that are that your lived experience, your learned experience, and it can be so visceral and we can learn so much about ourselves and, and be in concert uh, with our community in those moments. And so I, I look to institutions like uh, Crystal Bridges in the Momentary and, and, and Theater Squared and all of these incredible, I'm just thinking of some, um, to, to find ways to, and I know it's hard and, and arts organizations are always uh, strapped you know, for, for, for money at times in, in trying to figure out how do we reinvent, especially in a pandemic, these opportunities for this important work, especially when that important work is being sought after and is being craved more than ever. Um, so thank you for that. And I really, I, I wish I wish we had more time and I, I ask Sarah to find a way to, for, for these more of these conversations. I think it's so important. And, and um, at the end, I will put my uh, contact information because um, I would love to continue to have these conversations with folks. Um, but I want to ask all of, uh, I want to ask Diana, Kobe and, and Zora um, a two part question. One, what does allyship mean to you? And two, what do we do to expand this circle? Currently, there's 20 participants in this, this conversation. 20 can easily turn to 200, can turn to 200,000. But we need bigger circles. And we need the, the work of these circles to not be done just by you know Black, Indigenous, people of color. But we need dominant identity folks um, helping lead this work as well. So uh, Diane, I'll start with you. What is allyship and how, in your opinion, do we expand the circle or can the circle be expanded? How? Yeah, I think um, one of the primary ways that I think allyship first needs to happen is, as I mentioned before, I think it's important for allies to recognize their positionality and how they're able to navigate spaces. And when I talk about positionality, I mean identities related to race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, but beyond that to like language, you know, most of the content that we see everywhere is in English, but I'm thinking about folks like my mother, you know, or other folks that um, English might not be their primary language. So how inaccessible spaces are, um, so I think about that, I think about immigration status. I think about, you know, on a daily basis, there's folks headed to work that don't have legal status and that could be pulled over by a uh, police officer and be further criminalized. Um, so I think about the ways in which certain folks have these different axes to, to privilege and are able to navigate more, um, more freely because of that. I think it's important for people to do that self-analysis. I mm -hmm. think. Um, important that we also recognize the implicit biases that it, that we all have and these biases are perceptions that we have towards social groups and how those inform everyday decisions I tell people all the time every day you make political decisions whether or not you recognize them as being political decisions um, I think identities are inherently political um, I think for allyship to or for the for the circle to expand, I think that allies need to give up space. I think that they um, need to understand the way their their access to social, political, and historical spaces that have been inhabited by them that give them inherent um, advantages um, over BIPOC and, and marginalized folks. Um, and I think that we should allow BIPOC or a historically marginalized communities um, to lead. Let them lead. Because I think that there's this, there is this inherent knowledge, you know, or knowledge that ancestral knowledge that has been passed down that needs to be recognized as being valid and as being truth. Who, Diana, you are bringing the heat, you are bringing the realness, and you are bringing me such joy to to hear your thoughts and to hear your vision um, is so empowering, and and I I hope everybody understands that there that we are stronger when we give access to a greater number of people and and it's not just in the you know you know touchy feely kumbaya sense honey the numbers bear it out organizations that have 
diversity of gender, diversity of racial ethnicity, do better, bring in new ideas. They think outside the box, they outperform. And so, you know, I, cause I'm used to doing this in, you know, C-suites all the way down to first years in college that at every level, we know the virtues of this. And it really just speaks to a sense of human decency. And you're absolutely right. If we have brains, we have biases. That's just how it works. Um, and and so we, we have to be willing to, to do the hard work of challenging ourselves um, to be better than we were today, because that's a gift. That means I'm, you know, my superpower is I get better every day. That's dope. Marvel should write that superhero character. All right, Kobe, your turn. Allyship and expanding the circle. Well, I think, I think through stories, I think through true interactions, and I think the times when an ally has meant the most to me is when they spoke when I could not speak. Um, and I think that's so important. There are times, there are platforms where I am not given the power or the position to speak on behalf of things. There's even been times at my school as the principal of the school that there are certain issues and topics that are not really comfortable for me to speak on. Mm. But someone, one of those allies, they could speak and it could be heard and it actually can be, um, it can actually make a difference as I can't say the exact same thing they've said. And it's unfortunate, it's just real. It's, it's just, who, it's what we deal with. Um, I think if we're gonna expand the circle, um, we need allies to not just be a part of conversations like this, but leave these conversations and go and talk to other people. Um, they need to go and be a part of other organizations that they can start listening. I mean, obviously I serve as the president of the NWA and AACP. Come join us. Um, we want you to be a part of those conversations with us. We are all about social, um, about figuring out ways to provide justice for everyone. We want to create a social community where all voices are heard and welcomed. Be a part of those things. We need you to be our ally. We need your voice. We need your position. Um, you need to be friends with people that are not like you. Um, if I only interact with people that are like me, I only see the world as those people. Mm. I see it like other people. I need to experience what other people experience through their eyes, through their, through their world, through their career through their culture, through their heritage. And that only happens when I open myself, myself up to being a part of these other communities. Um, I, have, I have learned so much from people who are nothing like me. And so I just really encourage you to step outside of the comfort of your neighborhoods where everyone looks like you or your churches, where everyone looks like you or talks like you and come from the same community as you and get to know some people who are different than you um, that's really what we need from allies. We need them to not just say, I've got a black friend or I know someone who's Hispanic. They need to be in their homes and be a part of their lives and make them a part of your life. Um, I told this story to a friend and I didn't realize it as a kid, but I had a friend who was white and we were really great friends for many, many years. But I didn't realize until now as an adult that I never, he was never able to be in my space. I mm. only be in his space. I could be invited to his house. His mom was always the one who drove. Um, if my mom was driving, that wasn't really acceptable. He never came to my house. That's not opening up to each other's world. I got to see his world and I know all about what his world looks like. And so I just encourage you to start expanding that circle by knowing people and really knowing them. And I want to know those people. So if, if I could be that person to you, please let me. And so I think Ooh. that's what I'm thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Kobe. Thank you. That word on your wall, gather. <laughs> gather around and listen to the gospel of Kobe Davis. The doctor is in. Um, thank you for that. On, on so many levels, thinking about um, what is, is, is sadly the truth. I bet uh, folks on the line, if you asked 
that what Kobe talked about is is a a regular narrative in BIPOC communities of um, I know that I, I think of multiple of my friends where that's exactly the case that it was I was very you know when you talk about oh I'm not a racist I've welcomed a, a brown boy into my home many a time absolutely but did you ever make the the space to go into their home um, and, and and but then there's also that part of 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 you know my brown family feeling like we do are we able to host as if we're you know it's it's the white neighbors it's not like we're having the freaking royalty over but that sense of of what the pressure and the feeling and that's when we talk about that is systemic uh, oppression right there is this person doesn't even have to have any more money, but because of the color of their skin, it feels very different. And so um, thank you for, for sharing that Kobe and um, whew, uh, powerful, 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 both you and Diana and, and, and Zora, I wanna ask you this, this question and round us out. Um, allyship and expanding the circle, other than just your photographs being able to bring us all in. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, Diana and Kobe, both very tough acts to follow. Um, but I, I mean, I don't really have much else to add. You know, I, I think that to me, it's, you know, just, um, you know, the answer for me to both questions is um, learning how to confront your own privilege as a way of leading a more mm -hmm. sensitive life, you know, like that, that you have to make room to be sensitive to the needs of other people, you know, for, you um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really have much to add past that, that, you know, people are, are struggling that like, you know, for somebody like me, like it's a very uncomfortable experience in every aspect of everything that I do. You know, I have to carry around this heightened sense of awareness and be cautious of my own behavior because of how people respond to me as a black man. And um, so, you know, I think it, it's under, it's not that I'm asking you to feel those things because there's no way that you can ever feel that. But it's it's asking you to understand that this is real for me. And so when I might need some time or some space that like, that's that's completely like a, a normal thing to ask for. Um, and I don't think that we do that enough in, in confronting our own privileges. You know, I, I think about my own privilege to, um, you know, like I, I have a job that I, I can work remotely and I don't have to be out in public and be in contact with people. That's a privilege that I have to confront. Um, you know, being, being a, a man in this world, that's a privilege I have to confront. Um, and that we all have different levels of privileges in our own lives, but um, often we don't, we don't make enough time and space to acknowledge them and, and understand how, you know, like it, it might affect other people. Thank you, Zora. We're, I'm going to come to you and, and I have one last clothing, closing thought before I want you to round us out. Um, I want to ask everybody on the call, um, when, when this ends, whenever it ends, I ask one minute of your time. Find a scrap of paper, grab your phone, open the notes app and write down three things that you will do. I'll give you two weeks three things that you will do in the next two weeks that will enhance both your creation of space in yourself, whether it's reading a book, buying that book, starting that book, watching a documentary, joining the NWA and NAACP or joining another organization, write down those three things. And if you need some level of accountability, email them to me. I will put my email address in the, um, in the chat. I challenge you to do that. I will check in in those two weeks and ask where you are. I won't judge you, but I will check in with you in two weeks. If you need that level of accountability, I will put my email address in there. And that's the start. That is the start. We start with three things. We make that space, as Zora so brilliantly pointed out, we invite that, that those folks in, and we we because the I saw a meme earlier that said here's the here's the comfort zone, and then it had a little arrow outside of it and said that's where the magic happens. We sometimes have to step outside of that comfort zone and know that folks from traditionally marginal, marginalized communities we are very used to being outside of that comfort zone. We know that feeling. It ain't too pretty. It can get very scary at times, but that is where the magic happens. That's where I've grown the most because I've had to learn in order to get ahead in this world. And so I ask that you write those three things down and that you hold yourself to it. It's the least we can ask, okay? 
Now I'm going to come back to you, Zora, and, and close us out with another one of your beautiful Yeah, absolutely. Pieces. My pleasure. Okay, so, so yeah, so we're just going to kind of repeat. So just here's a little reminder of the first image that we saw. Um, and so to close us out this evening, I chose um, this pair of images. Um, and so um, <clears throat> again, just thinking about, you know, like the discussion that was just had, maybe some things that you're thinking about, things you feel you've learned, um, things you might be taking away, um, you know, just kind of consider those things uh, while you look. Um, but this is a portrait of uh, Miss Joy, um, and she's a descendant of survivors of the Tulsa massacre. And, um, you know, she's gesturing as she speaks her truth of living in North Tulsa. Um, and particularly, she was talking about North Tulsa being an essential service and food desert. Um, and this is the hospital where she was born, and it's now closed. Um, and, and so just take a moment uh, to, to sit in these images. Um, you know, recall the photograph that we started with tonight and those feelings that you took away from it. And maybe incorporate the concepts of presence and absence, you know, as you're considering this. Um, and you can also think about how we relate to the landscapes that we live in and the histories those landscapes contain. Um, and so I'll just give you a little bit of time here to, to think. Okay, so keep looking, but now think about the idea of unity. Um, unity and knowing that our region has significantly improved education, um, access, and, and better local policies that raise up Black liberation, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And just take that in for a moment again, and, and just we'll take, we'll keep spending some time looking at these images. And so the last things I'll ask you to consider as you continue to look is that I would like you to think directly about your race. I'd like you to consider a moment, any moment that you've had to confront your racialized identity, or maybe you haven't had to have that experience. So you can think about that as well. Um, but if you've had a moment where you've had to, you know, openly confront your race, when you think about that moment, what did you experience mentally? And what did you experience physically? Um, and now you can take some time and just please type a word or phrase in the chat, anything that's on your mind, and I'll read your words out loud to the group. Worthy. Granted. self-discovery and misidentification. Courageous conversations. Acceptance and hope. Positionality.
validation and action, opening my mind, thought provoking, proximity to whiteness as a non-black person, wholeness, stories waiting for listening ears, All right, I think we can we can wrap up there. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for um, for participating and you know for looking at my my photographs. Um, if you want to see and and learn more about uh, this particular story, um, it'll be in the next issue of Smithsonian Magazine. If you keep your eyes out for it, uh, it'll hit newsstands soon. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, it's it's past eight o'clock, and uh, I really want to thank our circle leaders today. Anthony, great job facilitating. Zora, Diana, Kobe, um, it, we really appreciate you all kind of helping Crystal Bridges move in the direction of being an anti-racist institution. And we encourage you to continue these conversations outside of the circle. Um, and also join our Pass the Mic for Justice program on Sunday, February 28th. So again, thank you all so much and we hope to see you around town. Have a good night.